Greetings from the Hilltop. Welcome to today's webinar, McDonough Women Changing the World, presented by the Stanton Distinguished Leader Series. I'm Lauren Apicella, Associate Director of Alumni Relations for Georgetown McDonough, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we get started, I do want to share a few tips and reminders. This broadcast is being recorded and will be shared with you in the next few days. Our panelists, um, our panelists will take questions throughout the webinar. Uh, for those of you that submitted questions during uh, uh, on the registration page, we have included those in today's panel. Um, but if you have questions, you can send them in using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. If you're having any technical difficulties or other issues, please submit those concerns to me via the Q&A function as well. Um, now I want to turn it over to Senior Associate Dean Michael O'Leary to get started. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Lauren. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for joining us for today's Stan Distinguished Lecture Series. It's a discussion with a group of impressive McDonough alumni who are changing the world. The series was established by Dan and Mary Stanton, parents of two McDonough alumni, and our Stanton series connects our McDonough students and community with renowned executives who share personal stories about leadership. Today's program is inspired by a new book, that chronicles the stories of our alumni over six decades since Rita Zakis Salicki, our first female business graduate, uh, since our first female student graduated in 1960. The book is titled 60 Years of Alumni, Memories, Milestones, and Momentum. And I worked with a team of more than students, 40 students and staff over three years to create the book. We worked in the university archives. We interviewed more than 70 alumni plus faculty and staff and wrote chapters on each of the six decades to put our graduates in the local and national context of the decades when they graduated. The team included Lauren, whom you just heard, as well as an amazing group of staff from the school's offices of marketing and communications, alumni relations, as well as the university's registrar, the alumni house, and the archivist. Now that the book is finished and available for everyone to order, I think it's especially important and already having an impact on our community in three important ways. Let me say just a little bit about those three. First, the team behind the book had a tremendous task of searching through the university's early records where students were identified by first initial and last name and to simply understand how many women have graduated from the school and to learn who they are and what their accomplishments have been was incredibly difficult. But we now have documentation that recognizes all of our graduates, men and women. Second, our alumni have amazing stories. And the more that we learned, the more eager we were to capture them on record. At first, we weren't sure what we would learn about our graduates, especially our early ones. But it quickly became clear that they were a diverse and global group of trailblazers who weren't afraid to be among the only women on the hilltop or among the only women breaking down barriers in the workplace early on. And finally, through the words of our alumni, we learned so much about their experiences in business and government and nonprofits and the important work that still needs to be done as we push for gender equality. If we're true to our Jesuit values, we must make it a priority of our McDonough community to accelerate their momentum as we continue to change the landscape of work now and into the future. So we take this final point very seriously. At the McDonough School of Business, one of our top initiatives is ensuring that we have a culture of inclusion and belonging. And as part of that, we have a standing committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is co-led by Senior Associate Dean for the undergraduate program, Patricia Grant, who will be our moderator today, and myself. As part of this effort, we have a series of task forces focused on DEI for students, faculty, and staff, and drawing on the wisdom and experience of our alums all over the world. Concurrent with this work, our degree programs have been focusing on recruiting diverse classes, have accelerated, and that's been accelerated by the fact that our MBA program created a position several years ago to focus on DEI recruitment. As a result, at the start of this academic year, our graduate program set records for the enrollment of women and underrepresented minority students. And this year, our faculty have also launched a DEI lecture series with a recent event focused on women in research and groups like our Center for Financial Markets and Policy have hosted discussions about women in specific industries. Today may be the last day of Women's History Month, but I hope you'll all be inspired by the stories you hear so that you can carry forward our goals around inclusivity and belonging every day of the year. 
And of course, this project wouldn't exist without the participation of our alumni themselves. They were willing to share their authentic personal and professional experiences and allow us to capture them and share them more broadly. So today, we're pleased to have four of the women featured in the book share their experiences with you all. Melissa Bradley, Fatima Duji, who's joining us uh, fairly late in uh, the day, her time from Tanzania, Jennifer Sheehy, and Gina Wolf. So thank you for joining us today and for the time you devoted to helping our team craft your profiles in the book. We look forward to hearing a little bit more from you directly today in the panel. And it's now my pleasure to turn the program over to my colleague, Patricia Grant, who will formally introduce each of our alumni and moderate today's discussion. Thank you so much, Dean O'Leary. It's so exciting to be with all of you and uh, to be able to celebrate our alumni in both print and digital form. And today, of course, we're engaging live uh, with each of them. And so we're excited uh, to, to go through the panel and, and highlight the many ways that each of them uh, have since their graduation enlightened and enlivened our community. First, I'd like to uh, bring forward uh, from our graduate, our undergraduate class of 1989, Melissa Bradley, uh, who's a tri-sector leader with more than 20 years of entrepreneurship, investment, and leadership experience. Through initiatives like Project 500 and 1863 Ventures, Melissa is committed to accelerating the representation and success of minority entrepreneurs. We also are fortunate to have Melissa as a member of our faculty, teaching impact investing, social entrepreneurship, and innovation. Member of our undergraduate class of 2010, Fatima Duji is the Director of Marketing at METL Group, where she oversees a portfolio of 150 products and services. Her book, Marketing for an African Powerhouse, also has been taught as a part of the Georgetown McDonough curriculum. Additionally, she is the founder of Educate, Empower, and Inspire, which empowers women to use their gifts, talents, and strengths to make a difference in their lives and also raises the awareness about the importance of empowering women, both for society and the economy. A member of the MBA class of 1997, Jennifer Sheehy is the Deputy Assistant Secretary leading the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the US Department of Labor. There she develops policy that increases job opportunities for youth and adults with disabilities. She also holds an appointment by the president to the Ability One Commission. She held numerous positions within the US Department of Education over the course of a decade. And she has worked for, a presidential, for the Presidential Task Force on Employment of Adults with Disabilities as a senior policy advisor and the National, uh, and the National Organization on Disability as vice president and director of its CEO council. Last but not least, we're proud to have with us a member of the undergraduate class of 1968. Gina Wolf is the former vice president and academic dean for the Catholic Theological Union. Her scholarly interests focus on leadership and social and economic justice issues, particularly as they impact women. She also is a senior Wicklander fellow at the Institute for Business and Professional Ethics at DePaul University. She currently serves as the Transitional Executive Director for the Society of Christian Ethics and is an active member of the Catholic Theological Society of America. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And with that, let's begin our discussion. First, it would be wonderful to hear each of you comment on your own journey, uh, being educated in the McDonough School of Business and to maybe comment on how that education has inspired you to focus on leadership, social and economic justice issues throughout your time post Hilltop. Tell us a little bit about how they may relate to and impact women. And if you could work in a little bit about how the evolution of Cura Personalis has um, evolved over uh, in campus and perhaps even in, in your professional lives. Anyone can begin. 
So I'll start if that's okay. I want to thank you for inviting me and humbly part of a great group. And I want to give a special shout out to Sean and Lauren and the entire team of putting the book together. Uh, I think it's an amazing uh, contribution to the community writ large. Um, so I have to admit, I went to Georgetown and um, had no idea about Cura Personalis when I first got there. Um, I knew it was a, it's the only school I applied to. I got an early decision um, for all other reasons, not including basketball. Um, I, that was where I was going. <clears throat> but I remember very vividly my freshman year at the club uh, event that they have on uh, Copley Lawn, uh, a woman who is now one of my best friends came to me and said, what are you doing for your community? And I was like, I'm just trying to graduate and get a degree and make some money and give back. And she's like, that's not enough. And I was like, okay. And she enrolled me in the after school kids program. Um, and it changed my life. Um, every Thursday night, I'd get on a blue short bus and go to St. Augustine's church and volunteer. And during that time, she was there. And, and I came to understand that part of being in the Jesuit community is not just taking care of yourself and thinking, in a futuristic way, how can you help others, but really figuring out what is your capacity to care for others in this moment in time. And I didn't believe I had any assets to give at the time and, and later realized that I had so much to give these young people. And those young people, more importantly, had so much to give me because they certainly frame my future life, uh, whereby after I sold my first company, I started a program in partnership with the After School Kids program. And it put me on this path of entrepreneurship training for young people, as well as adults and, and families. So over the time, it is something that I had no idea about that I'm very proud of. Um, I have been told uh, by some of the graduate deans at Georgetown that I am one of the few professors who actually refers to the crossing class and actually proactively puts care personnelis in my syllabus. Uh, and we spend a lot of talking about it. And, and I have the privilege to do that because I teach courses like impact investing and, and social entrepreneurship. Um, but I think it's extremely important because I think there's been an inconsistency in, in people understanding what does it mean and how does it become applicable when you graduate. And I think it's extremely important for MBA students. And, and I think now my entire life, my, my kids, uh, none of which unfortunately have yet to go to Georgetown, uh, but certainly no care personalis. And, and I would say that my entire life right now was dedicated to making sure that women and entrepreneurs of color uh, who are historically under served and overlooked are visibly seen, um, that our contributions and our assets are counted for, uh, and that would become part of the mainstream conversation on economic recovery and economic stability for this country. So I, I, um, I have signs all over the house to say I, I bleed Hoya Blue, uh, but the Georgia University experience has been everything to me. I don't know if I would have been the same person if I'd gone somewhere else, and I'm proud that it took me maybe about nine months uh, to really figure out what career personnel is, but it's very much core to who I am and certainly in the teachings for my students and more importantly, the teaching for my kids. Jennifer, it looks like you want to chime in. There. Sure, I'll jump in there and uh, thank you so much. This is so exciting and I'm thrilled to learn from these amazing women too. Um, so I went to business school in my uh, first class was 1995. And um, actually, I have a true confession. When I went to business school, I didn't know what all the values of Georgetown were. I was um, really gung-ho on the, uh, the material uh, benefits of business school. In fact, um, I was having a little struggle in marketing ethics, I remember. And um, there could be members of my group back then on today. Uh, but we were looking at a Black and Decker recall uh, case study where they were, um, where Black and Decker coffee machines were bursting into flames. And our response was to send the customers some kind of coupon for a Black and Decker fire extin extinguisher. And that was not the right answer. So. Um, there was a little learning curve there, but most importantly, it, it started to evolve our collegial nature, the, the whole um, camaraderie aspect of Georgetown really helped me in a defining moment of my life. I had a, a great internship for the summer. I was focusing on marketing and communications, and I went out to St. Louis to work for Anheuser-Busch. And um, I'm a very, very strong patriot now, and of course in the federal government, but back then I couldn't think of anything more patriotic than selling as much American beer as possible, and I was ready to do it. Um, but I had a spinal cord injury. I was pushed backwards in a swimming pool and broke my neck, and I had 
a tough rehab. It was, I use a wheelchair now, it, it was about a six month rehab just to get through the hospital and um, get back home. And at that time, I went back to business school uh, and it was just overwhelming the support I had from the Georgetown community. Uh, the friends just across the program were so inclusive and the professors, they still held me to high standards, uh, didn't treat me differently, but did give me the supports I needed to continue to be successful. And I realized after that, that um, this was an unusual, it was an unusual uh, Georgetown and uh, community outreach and they were participating, participating in my recovery um, as much as I was. And it just forged a dedication to changing my career path a bit and wanting to help other people that have disabilities like I did um, achieve their own success and get the supports that they don't have, uh, which is why I really decided I wanted to go into the federal government eventually too for, at a national level where you can have an impact across the country and take good practices and replicate them and then design policy in order to scale those for as many people as possible. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say I'm, I am much more ethical, I promise. And I also really enjoy doing what I do, but I just love Georgetown for the foundation um, the university gave me and the friends and the colleagues that helped me through my rehab. I think you're on mute, Patricia. Thank you so much. It wouldn't be a webinar if that didn't happen. So I, I just, I appreciate how we, uh, the, where the conversation is going. I wonder if uh, Gina and Fatima, if you have something that you'd like to add there, or if you said maybe you'd like to talk about how Jesuit values have uh, factored into your work as you've uh, done work globally. Um, I just want to share a, a short story um, of one professor that kind of just changed my life um, at Georgetown, Professor Bees, um, he, and he was a business professor, professor of management. Um, I actually took four classes with him out of the six um, for my major, and I remember um, one day he was like, do you want to know the secret to success and happiness? And we were like sitting there thinking, oh my God, we're going to learn like this amazing thing. Um, and he said, you know, to be successful and to be happy, you have to find a purpose um, that's bigger than yourself. Um, and that didn't, you know, you know, when you're young, you know, you're just kind of like, okay, cool. You know, um, I graduated in 2010, started working in marketing, created the marketing department. But, you know, I was living on autopilot. I wasn't really happy. Like, you know, it was just like, just work, work, work. Um, and I, there was like, there was this very hollow feeling still going on. Um, and, I, and I remembered his words because, you know, I had put it up, um, that, that, that thing on my board, you know, just that quote. Um, and I realized that whether it was in my marketing, in my leadership, or in anything that I want to do, your purpose has to be bigger than yourself. And so, um, you know, I started connecting with my customers on a more, um, uh, you know, on a, on a deeper level, on a more emotional level. My marketing campaigns were not just to make money or to sell my product, but to actually engage with people and to make a difference. Um, but also I started a series of, um, uh, of uh, a, a TV show called Educate, Empower, and Inspire, where I interviewed over 50 women in Tanzania that have gone through, you know, different adversities and challenges and just sharing their stories. Um, and now I had one of the biggest football, women's football teams in Tanzania, because I know the challenges that women face. Um, I, I'm, I'm a golfer. I've been golfing since I was six years old, old and I know how, how much of a challenge it was being a woman um, and being a golfer. So just trying to create um, and, and make them understand their value. Um, and all this had just come from one professor at Georgetown who really understood the values of Georgetown. And, um, and change my life completely. Well, 
Well, I find all these stories really interesting. I have to admit, uh, you know, Melissa talks about Kira Personalis, and when I uh, listen to some of the younger alum uh, who are here in the Chicago area talking about women and men for others. Those sorts of uh, phrases, if you will, weren't in use when I was there in the 60s, uh, but the values were there. Uh, they, they were embedded in things and professors cared about you. Uh, you know, the, it, it was there. For me, what I found really interesting in that regard. Um, when we were living in Hong Kong, I was working uh, for Business International. It's an economic research company. Well, it was a small one. It was bought by the Economist Group. Uh, and I was a desk officer, among other things, for Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. And um, I was in the Philippines at one point, and uh, I had a meeting with the Under Secretary of Labor. I was trying to get the latest statistics, uh, you know, labor statistics, et cetera. And our conversation finished. You know, he had your twenty minutes, et cetera. And he said, um, "Could I ask you a personal question?" I thought, "Oh, okay," you know. Um, and he said, "You're the first American woman who's ever called on me." He said, "What is your educational background?" And of course, I said, well, I was at the business school at Georgetown. And he just smiled and you know, he said, oh, he said, that's a Jesuit school. I went to the Ateneo de Manila. And then we talked for 15 or 20 minutes about Jesuit education and Jesuit values and how they impact uh, your life, your personal life, your work life. And so um, Though it wasn't as, uh, you know, the banners weren't hanging on campus saying women and men for others, um, those values sure impacted. Uh, and they, they impacted me in a lot of ways in my own career, too. You know, I mean, I think that's part of why I got into ethics. Uh, it was a response to an issue in the Philippines in the late 70s. Uh, in the pineapple fields, not unlike what was going on in California with Cesar Chavez and the, the workers there trying to organize and get better benefits. And I was asking about it because it was my job to write about it for our client base. And I, the, the most complimentary comments were, oh, a bleeding heart liberal. But for the most part, the response I got was, this is the problem with women in business. They don't know the rules of the game. They won't play the rules of the game. They want to change the way things are done. Um, they just don't belong there. And I thought there has to be a better answer. And that was one of the things. There were a number of reasons why I went back to graduate school and uh, worked in theological ethics with a social justice impact. But that was clearly one of them. Uh, so those values have been there for lots of decades, that's for sure. I wonder if you could keep keep on the same note and, and talk a little bit about how poverty and economic issues maybe intersect with peace and security uh, for women mm -hmm. in particular. Uh, and, and you can talk about that from both, uh, from either the global perspective or the uh, US domestic perspective. Yeah, well, you know, I want to say if, if um, women don't aren't able to support themselves and their families, if they have a family, uh, it puts them at great risk uh, on lots of levels uh, from th there's a whole range. There's the, the obvious poverty, uh, which leads to health has impact for health. Uh, it has impact, a dependency can have impact on uh, the vulnerability to domestic violence and every and all of that. Uh, you know, I, I've been working recently with a lot of the data that uh, Georgetown's Institute for Women, Peace and Security has put out, which is terrific data. Uh, and it helps, you know, to understand the complexity of the issues. But um, the, the common thread is, you know, the you don't get education if you don't have the money to pay tuition. You know, in a lot of countries, Vietnam is an example. Uh, even for grade school, 
tuition is required. So you have people who, um, if they don't have the income, their children don't go to school. Um, so there, I mean, it's very complex, but um, it, it really is important if we're going to make any progress in terms of women's empowerment uh, to deal with the economic justice issue as well as the other issues that I've named and others on this panel have a lot of experience in that area. So I do the research on it and write, but they, they actually are in the trenches. <laughs> Yeah, Fatima, I see you nodding. Uh, do, you, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, you know, um, actually, I have a story to share. Um, I interviewed a lady um, called Rose, and she um, she she was she has like basically started a widows association in Tanzania. And she was talking about how the culture here is that once you become a widow, you're kind of thrown out of the family. Um, your kids are also thrown out, so you're on the streets, um, like basically no education, nowhere to go. Um, and so then they have to resort to, you know, other means that then cause financial issues and health issues. Um, so she started an organization to kind of, um, you know, uh, help women become self-sufficient through, you know, just trade and um, learning basic skills so that they can, um, you know, they can uh, sort of empower themselves. And it's so fundamental because, you know, stories like this, people didn't even know about. People were not even aware about what was going on. Um, and, and through my platform, I was able to sort of share these stories and these challenges that all these women are going through and kind of open their eyes and um, even sort of educate people that, look, this is an issue. And, you know, what do we do about it now? That's great. Um, so I wonder, Melissa, if you can sort of jump in and speak a little bit about, you know, where we are now, you know, uh, 13 months, almost 14 months into this, this season that we're in, I, I won't use the P word, but just to say, you know, as people continue to, uh, you know, figure out what the future holds and are starting new ventures left and right, what do you think the, uh, will, will be the, uh, the, the opportunity for women going forward uh, within the workplace and how might that compare to what you witnessed in, with the 2008 recession? Yeah, you know, I think recessions typically have been an amazing time for entrepreneurial activity. Um, I don't know whether it's people are motivated by seeing gaps in the market uh, or motivated by their own economic risk uh, or economic security that is put in risk. Um, you know, I think the, the recent numbers that showed 100% of the layoffs that were experienced were women, I think sent a real signal effect um, that there needs to be another alternative. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I have never been fascinated with corporate America. I've only had two corporate jobs in my life uh, because this idea of extreme vulnerability as somebody else's whim is, is pretty scary, particularly for women who tend to uh, particularly certain ages are the sandwich generation. They've got their own kids and they're taking care of their parents. And so I think um, there has been a significant increase already as reported by the SBA and at least to corporations uh, in buying businesses and many of them have been women. Uh, and I think in part because one, we can multitask. Uh, and so it is something that we can do in our sleep because we're used to doing that. I think two, we are quite keen on seeing gaps in the market. Uh, and three, we know how to sell to our, our peers. Uh, and with women typically being in charge of the dollars and, and the pocketbooks in their household, I think that gives us a, a huge competitive advantage. While I'm excited about all the entrepreneurial starts, I still worry that less than 1% of venture capital goes to women. Uh, and so I think it just speaks to the fact that I, my fear is that many businesses will be started by women. But if we do not successfully smooth out the capital access glide path for women, where we are not legally charged more on interest rates for loans, uh, where if we happen to have uh, access to friends and family, it gets us where we need to go. But for those of us who don't, uh, that's a challenge. And then obviously getting in the venture capital space between pattern recognition and, and I would say the very blatant sexism that exists um, is very challenging. Um, I'm heartened by the, the increase in the number of, of firms that are led by women, GPs who have a focus on women, uh, but clearly those dollars that are aggregated within those funds do not closely compare to what I expect the demand or need to be for those companies. So I'm excited by the starts. Uh, I'm concerned, uh, but relatively optimistic on their ability to grow. Uh, and I think it's gonna be important because because we have the opportunity to be the real job creators in this country. 
Yeah, I wonder if, uh, if you and uh, Jennifer could even go uh, deeper to talk a little bit about, you know, how this is impacting uh, women and underrepresented minorities as they try to re-enter the workforce after having been forced out. Yes, and it's, it's, a, um, it's a, a national dilemma. And as Melissa said, uh, women have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, the jobs that they're, you know, that they have a higher uh, prevalence in the caregiving um, concerns that they have. And women with disabilities are even more disadvantaged because of that. It's just some of the um, statistics, you talked about poverty, 24% of women with disabilities in the prime working ages, 25 to 54, uh, live under the poverty level. And 10% of working women with disabilities live with the, um, under the poverty level. Um, well, one of the things, one of the things I love is transition. And, and that's, you've got to love it if you are a, a career federal employee. Um, but in, immediately after President Biden was elected, we looked at the campaign agenda. We looked at the priorities of the um, administration and clearly COVID response and recovery was so important, a top priority. But another equally important priority was the race and social equity and ensuring that recovery is inclusive of all underrepresented groups. The, the whole term build back better means that we don't go back to what we had before, that it's we, we need to start now to rebuild in a way that um, people from underrepresented groups, including those with disabilities, are included in the recovery and are not an afterthought, are not the last groups that come back to, to work and get those jobs. Um, and Melissa has also brought up the entrepreneur piece be, because of all those challenges that people face. Um, people with disabilities even have a higher rate of entrepreneurship than uh, people without disabilities. One of the things that we're working on is what we call recovery into inclusion. So I didn't coin that phrase, I love it, um, but it means that people with disabilities are considered in the recovery conversations. We have a lot of work in that area. We, we do uh, grants in return to work. So uh, coordinated health and employment services to make sure anyone who has, um, th whose job is threatened because of an illness or injury is able to get those services they need at a time where they're making those decisions to leave work and perhaps apply for social security and then never come off social security or ever get out of poverty again. And uh, we know that there are hundreds of thousands of people recovering from COVID who are now uh, eligible for the rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act, but they don't know it because they don't use the word disability. So we are working very, very hard to get those tools out there to people that um, don't know that they uh, have access to those and, and they can use telework accommodations or if they could use flexibilities and that they can actually require those at this point. So it's, it's a, a lot of work. We're working with all of the Department of Labor agencies and others in order to um, to make sure that underrepresented groups are all part of this inclusive recovery. Jennifer, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, I think, um, you know, what you're sharing around uh, the Biden administration's focus on inclusive recovery, you know, really um, pushes us to think about this moment in time that we're in. There's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, us coming out of this season, being able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And what that will mean economically for so many people, so many of the folks who were, uh, who are now worse off than they were before uh, we entered this this global uh, condition. And so I wonder if we could, you know, continue to talk about what this looks like in the U.S., but even go 
and span the globe uh, to to what things might look like, you know, uh, at, at the at the end of this tunnel that we we hearken and talk about, uh, and, and what will it look like for those forgotten people and those people who who are really just seeking seeking equity and uh, and, and inclusion in this society. So I, I want to say <clears throat> one of the challenges is. Um, that responses aren't one size fits all, even within a particular country. Um, so some of the things uh, in the US, we've got, uh, if you live in the Northeast, it's one of the best places to be a woman in terms, all, all the way around in terms of poverty, in terms of health, well-being. If you live in the Southeast, it's one of the worst regions. I mean, that, that's some of the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security data. But the same is true, uh, at least in my experience, internationally. Uh, one, one area that I've written a little bit about with, with my co-author is in terms of uh, responses to domestic violence. Uh, there, there's a woman that we interviewed for our, our leadership book a number of years ago uh, who started the first um, really domestic violence center in the Middle East. And there, unlike the US, you bring in the whole family, the abuser as well as uh, the one being abused. And it's a, it's a family together that deals with the situation and works to help the stop the abuse. Um, and I mean, we wouldn't do that in, in the US or, or in Europe. So, you know, I mean, Fatima, you've got lots of experience too. So, I mean, things that might work in Tanzania might, might not work uh, in some Asian countries and vice versa. So um, it's interesting, uh, we actually had a panel discussion about gender violence in sports um, just a few weeks ago. Um, and, you know, we, one, of the, one of the things that we were kind of proposing is a having more women in uh, leadership positions in sports so that to kind of um, eliminate these issues or actually bring them to light. Um, and number two, calling out on media because you know only 10% of media is, covers women's sports. So people don't know about it. People don't care because you know it's not a selling point. So in fact, it was you know it was interesting because I called out on the media and I said, hey, listen, you know you, this is something you guys have to do. You guys have to start reporting uh, more on women's football or in, and women's sport in general. And in fact, um, you know. Uh, it was the first time in Tanzania that they that one of the TV channels um, decided to do a live recording of a match uh, between two of the biggest teams in the country, and so this does a lot because it brings um, one it it gives women like the the sports players and women that the belief and value that they you know that they can provide um, through sports and that it's a means of income for them because there is this like a lot of stereotypes that, that comes with playing a sport and being a woman, you know, in, in, in Tanzania. Um, and I'm sure even in a, lots of parts in the world. Um, but also it kind of, um, you know, it's, it's kind of changing the dynamics of how people look at women in sports. That's awesome. Uh, Melissa or Jennifer, anything you want to add about uh, how we're, what we could look forward to uh, sure. I, and um, so one of the things we noticed in the very beginning of the pandemic, with the many, many people, most people, most underrepresented groups had been benefiting from the strong uh, economy and unemployment rates were, were lowest in history and for, for most underrepresented groups. Um, but as the pandemic hit, all of those groups experienced extremely high unemployment rates, job loss, and um, disproportionate health effects, of course, because of the pandemic too. We work quite a bit with employers. As, as all these transitions were happening, um, employers were saying, 
oh my gosh, what do we do? How do we move to a virtual environment or a safe and healthy workplace that includes people with disabilities and, and our employees with disabilities? Many employees were now people with disabilities. They'd never needed accommodations before because they were in an office or um, they had the equipment that they needed. So we were able to um, scramble and make sure employers had the tools they needed to ensure their employees with disabilities and employees with new disabilities were able to continue to work with um, the advances in technology or just the workplace flexibilities and schedules and, um, and the environment because they hadn't really considered them before. But now the things that they considered for people with disabilities, they were giving to everybody. And it changed the, the whole uh, profile of disability in a company so that it's not an other or a separate thing that just accommodating people with disabilities became what they were doing for all of their employees. So I'm really encouraged that when we do have the recovery, when people do start going back to work, the workplace is going to change incredibly. And it will be more hybrid now. There will be more flexibilities for everyone now. And people with disabilities will be able to um, be part of that inclusive recovery from the outset and not um, and, and not be forgotten. And, and underrepresented groups, uh, the same. We are hoping and doing everything we can in the Department of Labor uh, through all of the programs in the workforce system to ensure that employers know what to do to bring back all employees and to give opportunities to not only people with disabilities, but to those from underrepresented groups. And, and that is one of the reasons that we're putting the social and racial equity lens on all Department of Labor programs right now. We're assessing the outcomes. If they're not, if there are disparities, we are immediately looking at how we can mitigate those disparities and ensure that everyone can benefit from an inclusive uh, recovery and a stronger economy. Jennifer, that's great. I mean, I think um, you're bringing us into territory that's coming up in, in our Q&A function here that is asking us to, to really consider what this means for corporate America, what this means for the corporate space. You know, as we think about, uh, you know, the, the dimensions of breaking the glass ceiling and, and, and you know, what the metrics will be to know that that things have changed, uh, you know, how do we how do we think about these these challenges that still persist? I, I want to chime in if I can. I, I was looking at the the Q and A, and I'll combine the fifty plus since I finally hit that mark, um, and proud of it. You know, I think um, the one person noted that we all are working on our own things, but it doesn't mean we're not working with corporate America. Um, I would say that there are five task force that I'm on now with large corporations, uh, an example being Target, in terms of how they revamp all of their systems to better support entrepreneurs of color. Uh, there are some other similar initiatives that are looking specifically at women uh, that Brookings is doing. So I think there's a lot of activity of this kind of cross-sector uh, relationships where corporations, I think, finally recognize just because you have a DNI person in charge, it doesn't mean they have the capacity to make the change. Um, and I think that they're much more committed post George Floyd, post pandemic, to not just one offs, but real systemic change, which unfortunately we probably won't see for another 18, 24 months. But I can say that there are many corporations who are doubling up on those efforts. I think what corporations can do is one really um, think not just have DEI as this kind of separate initiative and oftentimes a cost center, which doesn't get the recognition it deserves, but but use that center as a catalyst to cut across all um, PL lines and say, what does that look like? Um, YouTube has been relatively successful in doing that. Google is in the process of doing that. Now we're working with them. Um, they started with us around their supplier diversity. Now they're going all the way across. Uh, McKinsey has the uh, program um, 
to support black entrepreneurs. Um, and they have a, I think it's a five or seven step program that they work with folks. So I'd say there's a lot of resources out there, but it, uh, respectfully, the, this task can no longer be ghettoized. It has to be fully embraced by the company. It has to have dollars behind it. It has to have accountable measures behind it. Uh, and so I think companies are creating task force that are inclusive of their senior leadership, but also outside experts, a lot of data experts um, who have done some kind of research. I've done research on the cost of being a black entrepreneur and how do you help them survive beyond five. You've got Brookings who's doing a lot of stuff on women. So I think that's been helpful. Um, I think we are also at 1863 working with AERP um, to specifically look at the 50 plus. Um, we are in the midst of creating some programs and some competitions for entrepreneurs specifically focused on, on 50 plus, but also more importantly, looking to support younger entrepreneurs who are building products and services for seniors. I think it's a double-edged sword. Um, you know, I think uh, having spent time in government twice, uh, you know, government can only do so much. A, it does respectfully, uh, Jennifer, it doesn't move as fast as we want it to. Uh, but B, it's really a catalyst and, and the private sector really has to be able to pick it up. The public sector can't do it all. And so I think for AERP and others like them, they are mindful of what is happening in labor, uh, what is happening with HHS and saying, how can that be catalytic to our efforts to be able to deliver more support to these communities who typically are overlooked and underserved, and I would say oftentimes not forgotten, particularly if they're not reflective of the leadership. I am somewhat heartened that we have seen uh, an increase, albeit what, two or three, uh, female CEOs in large companies, but they're all over 50. And so I do think that there's going to be a nexus of women, uh, also women of color, and, and I would say more experienced and seasoned women who are taking the helm of companies, even including the WNBA, uh, where we're beginning to see real traction because they're coming at it with a laser-focused perspective on, I am the target market, I am the customer, and so I know what these, these folks need. Uh, no disrespect to white men who are writing things, but it, oftentimes the process takes longer and they're just not in tune to what can be done for these constituencies. So when you say what's what do I, what, what the future holds, I'm optimistic. I don't think it's going to be a quick fix. Um, I like to believe that I'll see it in my lifetime, um, but I think we're past the part of initiatives and programs and really trying to talk about systemic change in society as what the work Jennifer is doing with the Biden administration, but also hopefully systemic change in companies. And so I, I do unfortunately have to say, I think we're going to need to be patient because uh, I don't think we can afford moving forward of more one-offs that, that vanish six to 12 months. We need things that are gonna last the next 20 to 30 years. So if we if we think about all the work that needs to be done and there's a lot, right, that, that will need to help us move the needle, you know, what role can men play in, in uh, you know, advancing change and, and doing it at a level that, that's catalytic uh, and, um, and systemic? Feel free to talk about that from a uh, you know, sponsorship perspective as well. So I know we talk a lot about mentorship, women mentoring other women, men mentoring uh, women, et cetera. And I uh, would love to know what you think about how that all comes together well, in the ecosystem. I, mean, I want to say, I mean, there, there are a lot of men that are supportive of women and women's roles. And I think it's important uh, in recognizing that, acknowledging it, uh, partnering with them, uh, you know, when, when I think back more chronologically, when it first dawned on some men was when their daughters were graduating from college and they, they were sort of, you know, the generation just following mine. So women who were graduating maybe in the, the late 70s, 80s, well, it's a, your, your sort of era where um, these men would say to me, well, I know my daughter, she's very bright and she's got a good education. I'm, I was, you all are the one that created the culture. You all have to help change the culture. And so I really do think when I look at my, my nieces and nephews in the younger 20s and 30 somethings, there seems to be much more of a parity there. Uh, I mean, that's, that's you, Fatima, you and your classmates. What do you think? So oh, you know you I think you hit the nail on the head you know it's um I think when you're educating you also have to educate parents because it all starts from there you know the the gender discrimination the, the words you use um, I think Sheryl Sandberg said like um, that you know when you're raising a child and you um, and a woman holds leadership qualities you call her bossy but if it's a boy you say oh wow he has so much potential right it's just these words that are used and I remember like growing up 
um, you know, I was like six years old and my dad used to make us play like four hours of golf every single day. And all of us have five other siblings um, and we all played a sport. And I remember I went up to him and I was like, I'm a girl. What are you doing to me? Like, I'm, I'm exhausted. Like, I can't play like four hours of golf every day. And he's like, I don't care. You're a girl and you're going to play. And, you know, at that time, I was so angry and I used to really dislike it. But um, it's helped me so much as a leader today. Because I believe that, you know, having that um, encouragement from your parents, um, you know, having them tell, like, make you believe in your value, the words that they use, it really does shape who you become. And so it all starts from a very young level. And so now, you know, I do a lot of mentorship for parents. Um, I do a lot of mentorship for young kids. So even like recently we had um, the women's soccer team uh, you know, like have a camp and like a, a like a community outreach program with young girls, because it all starts from there, building their character and, you know, making them believe in themselves, but also um, making parents understand that they have such a big impact on, you know, how their children turn out. Uh, so. I, I mean, I think there's a real role for men, but I, I, I will say respectfully, I, I, I run a tech company with two co-founders and both of them are white men. And we've had lots of conversations of making sure they understand what's the difference between being a coach, being a mentor and being a sponsor. Uh, we, I have sent them to training slash therapy to really understand what is their risk tolerance. Um, I think it's one thing for people to say they want to help. It's another thing for them to help publicly, as I think was just acknowledged in, in the Q&A section. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of people that support behind the scenes, but we need them to be much more vocal. Uh, and then I think the third thing is we've been um, selective in where they show up and how they show up. Um, so they actually uh, have a script of what they're supposed to say when they show up in certain places. Um, we're actually in the process of, of um, closing a VC round and we were very intentional having me lead that round, uh, but knowing when they did show up, how they should be acting, recognizing that they wanted to help me and more importantly, help venture capitalists understand that if we're running a tech company that's focused in women entrepreneurs of color, you need to actually listen to the person who's the demographic. So I, I think I wanna say that I think there's plenty of roles, but I, I do think that they need to be thoughtful in their responses. They may need some training. They may need some support um, because whatever they do say, they will send a huge signal effect and we can't afford any screw ups or mess ups, forgive me, um, because our, I think the window is closing for, for people to even be open to hearing what's happening anymore. Uh, you know, this is the last day of Women's History Month and, and I acknowledge that some of you said this needs to last forever. I'm always fearful these are the two months I get. February, which is the shortest month in the world, celebrates Black history. Okay, it ends and then everything ends. Like no more commercials, no more nothing. Uh, and so I, I'm hoping that, you know, instead of these months being the events in of themselves, they really become much more catalytic type conversations um, that continue throughout the year. But but I do think there's a role for men, but I think they need to be willing to take some direction from women uh, in terms of how they can help them because it's not a one size fits all approach. And I think it needs to be very curated and contextual to actually have the impact that we desire. That's really great. I think I, what I'd love to hear from each of you, if you would, um, before we close it out, is just to speak a little bit about that. Like, what, what are the, what's the power of role models or mantras and practices um, that have, you know, carried you through your your careers and, and your investment in uh, being women for others. I'll just uh, start with um, kind of. Uh, my example or, or what I learned and going back to uh, my experience at Georgetown and having those role models like um, some of my professors that were so supportive. And um, one of the reasons I went, used an MBA to go into the federal government, I know that was one of the questions, was that you can do anything in the federal government. Every job you can think of exists in the federal government. And in my role now, I'm able to do, um, you know, I do budgets and I um, manage teams and, and people. And I spend a lot of time with Dr. Annette Shelby, uh, her spirit on my shoulder, editing 40 page policy documents to become three page useful documents that someone will actually read. And, um, but it, my most 
fun part of the job is development of staff. And that is uh, uses so much of what I learned in organizational behavior or just the, the culture of Georgetown, as you were talking about before, that lifelong learning and helping people uh, develop to their potential and take advantage of their own careers and to make sure that they are connected with mentors. And if they don't see someone like themselves, for example, someone with a disability, to find those role models so that they can see themselves and feel that the expectations are high for them. Uh, so it's the, the role model and trying to de develop employees, trying to bring people up so that they can really fulfill their dreams. I mean, that, that really is part of Georgetown's culture too, I think. I, I, um, I will say that um, April 25th, 2020 um, changed my life forever because I had a stroke. Um, and I think that I was doing what every woman and particularly black woman does, which is trying to be everywhere, do everything, be everything I can to everybody and push off doctor appointments for kid care and uh, not do uh, walking or exercising because I had a webinar that I thought was going to be so important in helping my community. So I, I think I, I have shifted to say that we can't help anybody else if we can't help ourselves. Uh, and I've come to put a different spin or probably understand the full intentionality of care personalis, which is it's not just caring for others, but it's caring for yourself. Uh, and so every morning and every night I meditate, I've got all kinds of apps. Um, I try to, I, I have all kinds of gadgets. I've got a watch, I've got an aura ring. Um, I try to get my 10,000 steps in every day. Uh, I'm mindful of what I eat. Uh, my wife, who's also a Hoy, is very mindful of what I eat. Um, I've got accountability coaches in my twin daughters, 13-year-old twin girls, and I've got accountability partners in my friends uh, and my staff. And so I think that that was huge in, in being able to admit um, that I needed help and being able to recognize that there is not one day that I'm going to solve all the problems that I'm trying to undo. Uh, I'll be lucky if I make them marginally better before I go. And so recalibrating my own sense of urgency, balance with my own need and sense of self-care. Uh, and I, you know, I watched my mom who's 93. I think I learned her bad habits respectfully. And so I think it's important that we put a cycle in the cycle of caring more for others than we care for ourselves. Otherwise, we're not here to take care of anybody. I want to say amen to that, Melissa. That, that is, I think, one of the hardest lessons for women still today, uh, that, that uh, the self-care is important. I have a friend who, who uh, works also in theological ethics in the Jesuit at BC, and he's got a book he talks about what I've dubbed uh, virtues for the 21st century. And it's not that he does away with the traditional justice, prudence, temperance, et cetera, but he talks about uh, having a, a virtue that deals with relationships and then having one that deals with particular relationships and then developing the virtue of self-care. Because if there's no self there, then we can't be uh, women and men for others because we have to bring ourselves to that. So I think what you're saying is really important. And so often women put their own self-care aside and they're socialized into thinking that it's selfish. And so that, that would be a really, really important takeaway, I think, um, that it's important to be able to do things for others, you've got to take care of yourself. It's fantastic. Fatima, you've got the final word before I close. Yeah. Uh, first of all, that was timed so well because I'm at that point right now where I'm just so exhausted, um, you know, because you spread yourself so thin, you know, and, you know, you, you think you're doing so much, but then you end up neglecting yourself. But um, I think one, one thing that I really want to share is um, lessons on leadership that I just learned from my mom, uh, which is humility. Um, and, you know, just growing up, I remember my mom would just say, put your ego aside, treat people good. And, you know, as a leader, um, people watch the way you act, they watch the way you speak. Um, and, you know, uh, being a female leader, you know, especially, I think um, a lot of times you will find that 
sometimes you have to be a little bit more aggressive or, you know, to get your point across. Or, you know, I remember like I was a young leader and, you know, people wouldn't take me seriously at first, but I really learned the sense of humility from her and it's helped me so much. And um, it goes so well with the Jesuit values and what you learn at Georgetown, which is, you know, that stay humble and, you know, be kind and, and leave a mark you know, leave an impact. And it doesn't have to be such a big impact. Like you don't have to like be doing huge things. It's just small things, you know, that can help someone's life, so. Thank you, Fatima, Gina, Jennifer, and Melissa. This has been a fantastic conversation. We, we appreciate each and every one of you for the wisdom that you shared, the hope for all of our Hoyas who are joining us today for a brighter future one day at a time, one woman at a time, one man at a time, one Hoya community at a time. Thank you to the Stanton Leadership uh, Series for uh, sponsoring this. And we're so grateful to all of you for joining us and, sh and sharing such wonderful insights and questions. Uh, and with that, I wish you all the very best and Hoya Saxa. Thank you, Hoya Saxa. Thank you.